Hello and welcome this afternoon to Infection Control Principles for Hemodialysis Settings. This is a wonderful opportunity that uh, was suggested by our, our manager for the Healthcare Associated Infection and Antimicrobial Resistance and, and Antimicrobial Stewardship uh, Program, Andrea Flincham. When we talked about some of the specific um, concerns that we are seeing as we try to come to a, a new normal, uh, with our uh, post-COVID or post at least one, uh, one wave of post-COVID activities, and then think about how we can address some of the issues that the CDC has brought forward, and that is uh, that we have continued to, to lose some ground uh, that we had gained over the course of the five, five years prior to the pandemic. So uh, this is a, a time for us to rethink and regroup around some basic principles in some particular uh, settings, uh, in this case, the hemodialysis setting. So I'm very happy then to have this first of a three-part series where we will have um, Dr. Hudson Garrett uh, joining us today, uh, leading this particular session. And then we will also have uh, Susan Kelly uh, joining us. So some of you um, may recognize Susan's name. Susan has uh, been a lead with NHSN and uh, particularly in the area of hemodialysis and now is a, a high-risk infection preventionist at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. So I'm pleased to have uh, both of these colleagues today and I'd like to turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Garrett that has worked with us extensively in our Kentucky Infection Prevention Training Center as a part of the Norton Infectious Diseases Institute. Dr. Garrett has a, a wealth of experience both in uh, many areas of infection prevention and control, but also he is really one of the few people that is really overlaying infection prevention and control, patient safety, quality, and all of the aspects that we know are critical to truly making a difference. So uh, Dr. Garrett, if I can turn this over to you, and I'm very appreciative of your, your time today. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Carrico, and good afternoon to each of you. We're so honored to have you join us for this first of a three-part series, as uh, Dr. Carrico mentioned, and really honored to have uh, Susan join me today. Uh, Susan and I have worked together for many years on a variety of different projects, uh, and she just recently left the CDC to go back into the hospital setting, and so we're extremely honored to have her join us for today's program. Just to give you a little bit of a setup, this first program is really going to look at the core practices for infection prevention and control, uh, specifically related um, you, you know, to, to hemodialysis. We're then going to actually focus in on um, the, the sort of NHSN components on the second series. And then the third part is actually going to really bring it all together, where we'll do more of an integrative approach to looking at some of these uh, complex topics related to these vulnerable patients. So we are offering CEs for today's program as well as the other two programs. So there'll be one hour of CE credit granted for successful completion of today's program as well as the completion of the evaluation. Uh, since we're offering CE, you can see my financial disclosures available here for your review and Susan does not have any financial disclosures. I wanna jump right in directly to um, our learning objectives for today's program. And I've asked Susan to sort of chime in uh, at the end of today's program as we get questions in case there's uh, specific things related to NHSN that you want to address now or just other topics that might be within her specific skill set and expertise as well. But in this first program, we really wanted to look at the general infection control risk associated with hemodialysis patients. We know that these are vulnerable patients. We know that they have very specific comorbidities and complex challenges, as well as the equipment that's used to dialyze them. And so we wanna be really vigilant around that. Sort of the second bucket we're gonna explore is what are those CDC core recommendations that exist in infection control that allow us to do the very best that we can to mitigate those risks that are within our control? Right? We know that a lot of these things are completely preventable. And so if we can take those additional steps, uh, that will allow us to be even more successful. And then lastly, we're gonna talk just briefly about some of those vascular access challenges in hemodialysis settings as well. Keeping in mind that in our third program, we'll sort of integrate this all back together into what do we need to do for these patients as a whole? Um, and so that'll be a nice opportunity for us to look at some of the CDC toolkits and make those available to you. Uh, we did make uh, several of the checklists that are uh, pertinent to today's conversation available for you in the ebook. So please take a moment to download that. Uh, also, this program is being recorded and will be available to you uh, with the full recording as well as that ebook uh, as a reference after today's live program. 
Uh, we did want to start, though, with the why, right? Because so many times in healthcare, we just jump right into the topic or we actually go right into the recommendations, but we never, ever address the actual why about why the topic is so relevant to today's uh, conversation. And we know that there's bloodstream infections. We know that there's sepsis. We know that there's skin infections. We know there can be catheter and fistula infections. But the reality of this is that these patients are extremely vulnerable. And so these complications not only cause increased length of stay and hospitalization and antimicrobial resistance, but they also cause mortality and morbidity. And so with the number of people going on hemodialysis uh, care continuing to rise each single year, right, this is going to mean that we're going to see an increase in some of these risk um, factors as well as the potential populations that are going to be exposed to this type of care. Uh, the other challenge that we have is the use of catheters. Right? Our goal, of course, is to get away from the use of indwelling catheters and to get something more permanent like a fistula, something that's going to have a reduced risk for infection. We'll sort of talk about what that looks like in almost a sliding scale in infection risk uh, as we get towards the end of today's program. But generally speaking, the CDC has pretty good data looking at the overall surveillance in this population, but we're always, always missing things. And that's one of the exciting pieces that Susan will be covering in our second uh, in this series is really looking at what the NHS and data tells us, how we can collect it, and frankly, how we can be a part of that solution so that the more good data that we collect, the more positive outcomes we can actually produce with our patients. Um, and so this is a, a population that is historically been underserved um, and one that is extremely vulnerable for potential risk for preventable infection. Now, I also wanted to go back and look at the literature to sort of figure out where are these risk factors strategically coming from? And we found that if you look at all the CDC's published reports looking at sort of a combination of what's in the peer-reviewed literature, as well as what's been uh, sort of observed in their outbreak investigations, there's a couple of large buckets. Um, the first and foremost is adverse drug and device events, recognizing that not only are there different types of drugs and medications used in dialysis care, but there's also a multitude of different types of devices, most notably the dialyzer. Um, we, we know that there's going to be challenges associated with this, and oh, by the way, we have water. Um, and so with most recent events, like the uh, natural disaster in Florida, um, this is just another example of why preparedness as well as an understanding of how these devices are used and what we need to do to clean and disinfect them is gonna be an extraordinarily uh, big challenge for all of us that are facing this. One of the other things that we found is that a lot of times these devices may be maintained by other individuals. And so it may be, you know, maybe you're in an inpatient setting and you have this service that's done in-house. Uh, maybe you're in an inpatient setting and this is contracted out to a national company. Or maybe you're in an outpatient clinic, which is the majority of our dialysis care provided in the United States. And it's, again, going to probably be run by a national um, firm as well. All of these come with their unique challenges, um, you know, and so we need to be very, very vigilant. And this is where public health partnership comes in uh, to really be, uh, you know, a little bit more aware of some of the particular issues that can pop up with this. The, the second area that we're going to explore here is hepatitis. Right. We know that there's a lot of injections um, and so unsafe injection practices can be rampant in this setting, particularly when we have uh, workers that are not as skilled in, in some of these practices that are not as vigilant. Um, maybe we don't have the same level of oversight, for example, by having uh, enough registered nurses, which we know can be a challenge in some of these settings. Uh, you may have a lot of, uh, of technicians and so you may not have that traditional oversight. But when we see, you know, hepatitis, HIV, other bloodborne pathogens, we not only have the risk with safe injection practices, but we also have the risk, which is bloodborne exposure. This is not just a risk to our patients, but also one that we as healthcare workers need to be concerned with. So this is, again, a stark reminder of the importance of hepatitis B vaccination, uh, good cleaning and disinfection, and the appropriate use of PPE, right? But again, we continue to see these, and the most recent data uploaded by CDC see listed here is back in 2019. But I just picked uh, a few years. I will tell you that in the overall reference list, um, there are many, many more outbreaks associated um, with these different categories that go even further back. That again demonstrates a pattern of some of these challenges that we've seen. Another category, which is not surprising, is water. Right? We know that the water is an important element for providing care for these patient populations. There's a machine involved. We've got filters. We've got drain lines. There's a lot of things that could go wrong, especially when we don't have good maintenance of these devices. And so this has led to incidences of bloodstream infections, as well as other um, issues that have been reported back to CDC, again, 
where we're seeing issues with maintenance um, that are fully preventable. And so our goal here is to make sure we maintain the machine, make sure we protect the patient, and we actually keep the environment as clean and sanitary as possible. And so when stuff is not maintained properly, uh, we see this with other things like ice machines and, and, and even common things that are used um, in some of these settings. So if we go back to sort of the core sort of practices associated with infection prevention and control, I like to keep things as simple as possible. And there's really three big, big buckets where healthcare associated infections primarily originate from, right? The hands of either us as healthcare workers or the patient, right, becoming contaminated, which we see quite often. The contaminated environment of care, which in the dialysis setting is a huge one. Um, and then lastly, which is also extremely relevant to today's population that we're discussing, is the skin of the patient themselves, that, that microbiome, that intact skin. You know, certainly recognizing that the dialysis process does not lend itself towards intact skin. We're now making an artificial, you know, uh, break in the skin through the insertion of a catheter, um, insertion of a needle, maybe given injections, whatever it may be, as part of that person's care process. Every time that we do that, we're breaking that natural barrier um, a protection, which is the patient's own skin. So again, the nice thing is that we can prevent many of these infections with good hand hygiene, ensuring that we're doing proper and regular cleaning and disinfection. And we're also accessing these sites, whether it's a fistula or central line or some other type of device with proper antisepsis of both the skin as well as the device itself. So if we put this in a broader context of infection prevention and control, and we look at the, the sort of chain of infection transmission, right? It, we know that the patient should be at the very, very center of what we do. But again, COVID has really changed my perspective in many instances. Uh, it also has to be not just about patient safety, but frankly about healthcare worker safety just as much. Because if we're not there to properly care for our patients, especially in this setting, then these patients cannot receive the life-saving care that they need. And we all know what happens uh, when, when dialysis patients can't receive dialysis. It is not a good outcome. And so this is a particular area of healthcare where there is not a lot of margin for error. And so we need to do everything in our power to keep our, our, our workers safe and healthy and able to come to work. Now, part of this, looking at this particular population being fairly vulnerable, typically immunocompromised, uh, they're gonna typically have multiple comorbidities, right? Those infectious agents are gonna prey on some of those things. Right? So if you've got a, a sort of a weak respiratory system or a weak, uh, uh, renal system, we know that that's gonna be an area of vulnerability dependent upon the particular pathogen. Then we gotta have a way to sort of get it in you. Um, and so as a patient, maybe it's something that's a contact transmitted uh, you know, disease like MRSA or C. difficile. Uh, maybe we've got something that's gonna be more of a, a, you know, an airborne like TB, which of course we don't want in any dialysis centers um, or something more common like influenza which is more of a droplet uh, condition. And so our goal is to stop and break one of these chains, right? Uh, you know, we're trying to prevent this from ever going full circle and that way we don't have replication into those susceptible people, um, whether it's us as healthcare workers or the patient, but we also don't have outbreaks to our broader patient population. We saw this, you know, in a pretty wide scale with COVID where folks of course had to, you know, come and receive dialysis, but there were outbreaks in dialysis centers pretty rampantly. Um, across the United States. Now, there are different ways that we can sort of approach this, right? At the very, very bottom of this upside down uh, triangle, you'll see is the least effective sort of tool in our arsenal, which is PPE. Now, I wanna sort of preface that by saying that PPE is, is certainly an important element of our infection control strategy, right? But it is again, the least effective. So if we go all the way up to the top with elimination, right? Meaning that we're not gonna have that risk physically present anymore, um, it, it's never gonna actually be a, a potential harm. That is certainly our gold standard. So let me just give you an example that doesn't exist yet, but hopefully one day will. Let's say that there was a dialysis machine that was coated with a chemical that would never ever let any organism grow on it. So it would actually never grow a bacteria. Um, it would not uh, let you know viral particles survive nothing. There would be no ability for a microorganism to survive there. Well, that would eliminate the need for disinfection. Um, and you could just wipe it down with a, a wet rag, just totally making this up, of course. Well, this all sounds too good to be true because it likely is. And of course it doesn't exist yet. But if I was able to eliminate the, the actual hazard, right, then that would be something that would be a game changer. Well, let's sort of use a different example that's more realistic. 
let's say that there was a vaccine that existed out there that actually eliminated the chance, that possibility for, for the rest of your life of you getting that particular disease, right? Many of us would probably want to take that vaccine if it was something that was pretty common that we might be exposed to either as healthcare workers or just general members of the community, right? Because elimination is a powerful thing. Our goal is to eliminate the risk ever reaching the patient and frankly to us as well. We also see sort of a combination of these approaches being used. Things like engineering controls, um, where maybe we put up plexiglass, which we saw a ton of during the COVID-19 outbreak. And, and these were things that didn't really have a lot of evidence behind them, but made people feel good. And so my challenge is always using engineering control that actually is going to stop and, and sort of help mitigate that risk. We don't want to just do things that are going to make us feel good, but actually things that will really do good, right? And so there's all different types of, of ways that we can do this. And an example of an administrative control would be something as simple as what we see in restaurants, where you have a door in and a door out, right? Where you're able to sort of change the way the, the, the way that our people flow, right? So the servers go in one door and they come out another so that we don't have any traffic collisions um, in, in a professional kitchen. And so this sort of leads us back into how do we make sure we make the biggest um, indention, if you will, on infection prevention control for these preventable um, HAIs that we can actually get rid of or hopefully uh, really mitigate the risk for. And so CDC does have core practices for infection prevention and control that have been out now for several years. And unfortunately, we find that many infection preventionists and, and especially frontline clinicians are not as well versed and in some cases not even aware of these different core practices. And, and they're really meant to, to represent this is a roadmap for success to help us address preventable healthcare associated infections, right? And at the very top, you'll see is leadership support because without leadership support, we're never gonna be successful in our interventions, right? We have to have that top-down C-suite approach in order to really be successful and have sustainable results in our infection prevention programs. We've gotta make sure folks are well-trained and, and highly educated. We're gonna talk about competency in just a second related to the dialysis setting, because it does change a little bit from that general patient care environment. We've also got to provide education to the patients, the families, and the caregivers and, and give feedback um, and, and be willing to, to, to learn from that. One of the things that I really enjoy is sort of crossing over of healthcare between different disciplines, because frankly, I don't think we can solve most of today's healthcare problems in a vacuum. It really requires an interprofessional approach that is not afraid to reach across disciplines. One that is gonna allow us to enhance what we do for our patients, frankly learn from each other and do it in a team environment. That is really sort of the core essence of what we've got to do more and more of. Our standard precautions of course are designed to protect both the patient as well as ourselves. And you'll see some of those listed there. We're gonna go through a, a subset of those um, during today's program. Transmission-based precautions help us deal with more of those specific organisms that have different challenges, right? Something may be transmitted airborne, or maybe you have something that's more droplet like influenza, or maybe you have something like MRSA that's more contact. And again, our goal with dialysis is gonna to be to get rid of temporary invasive medical devices, if at all possible, and to protect us again as the healthcare worker environment We've got to have good occupational health because we know that this is a high risk exposure to blood and bloodborne pathogens in the dialysis setting. And so CDC sort of took this list and said, what are the most relevant aspects that will help us be more successful in the hemodialysis setting? And so Susan's going to talk about sort of the first one in our next program in, in greater detail because that's a complex topic. And so we wanted to make sure we dedicated a full hour program uh, to that. And so that's really going to deal with the National Healthcare Safety Network. The next one is all about hand hygiene, because we know that if we do that for both our patients as well as for our, our actual staff members, that's gonna be helpful in reducing the transmission risk um, in all healthcare settings. And that can be done with either alcohol-based hand rubs and our hand sanitizers, um, as well as our soap and water. We'll talk specifically today about our, our, our catheter and vascular access approaches, uh, staff education and competency, uh, patient education and engagement, what we can do to reduce the, the sort of usage of these temporary indwelling catheters, because we know we want to move away from those from a risk standpoint. And then lastly are really things all about the catheter and the site. Uh, chlorhexidine for skin antisepsis, which most of us are probably familiar with, uh, the catheter hub disinfection process, and then also the use of antimicrobial ointments and what is going to be more evidence-based there. Um, all of these can be found on the source that is listed there on the CDC uh, prevention uh, toolkit. 
Uh, so we invite you to take a look at that following today's program. Now, just a little bit of a glimpse into uh, what Susan's going to be talking about. Our surveillance and feedback, right, that's fed into the NHSN system, which is housed within CDC, is a critical element of helping us drive standardization, understanding best practice, and frankly, learning from our opportunities for improvement, right? Because we know that NHSN is going to give us not real-time data, right, because it doesn't, it doesn't do that, but it gives CDC an idea as a federal public health authority of where we need to focus our efforts. Where are the educational needs? Where is the public health um, you know, need? Are there specific patients that are being more challenging? Uh, how do we compare against state and national averages? And are there certain procedures or types of dialysis settings that are more risky? For example, is peritoneal better than hemodialysis? Um, how do we explain that type of information to the patients that are asking for this information and do it in a data-driven approach, which is really the core essence of evidence-based practice. Um, and so, uh, like I said, in that second program, we'll be going in more detail through that. What about hand hygiene? You know, hand hygiene is only as good as it's held accountable, right? And so while May is Hand Hygiene Month, uh, sort of internationally, I sort of refuse to celebrate that because I think every day should be Hand Hygiene Day um, because all of our patients really deserve that we are taking that sort of uh, very, very, uh, core approach, uh, consistent approach that's sustainable with every single patient interaction, not just during a particular month. That does require us to monitor what we're doing. You know, if you look at the sort of secret shopper approaches, those are typically artificially inflated because, you know, folks are going to know that people are looking and certainly when a clinician that's involved in that process is known that's then present. You know, let's say the infection preventionist, for example, or the facilities administrator, or maybe the charge nurse, as an example, is walking around, it's probably assumed that they're doing observations. And so you'll see a change in compliance that's existing there. The CDC does have a fairly robust hand hygiene guidelines that are available. They've also got some really great educational programs, and I'll show, show a few examples of those at the end of today's program that you're welcome to check out for further information. But you'll find that not only is the information there, but the sort of why behind the guidance, it also exists there. One particular thing related to hand hygiene that we know is really important, especially as we deal with this, you know, the dialysis setting, which has a, a little bit more of a crowded type of setting, right, where we have congregate settings, our patients are pretty close together, is as we're going back and forth, even if we're not wearing gloves, we still need to sanitize our hands. Right? And so the CDC's guidance is to use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with an alcohol concentration between 60 and 90%. Now, keep in mind that there's two different sort of forms of alcohol out there, two different formulations. There's isopropyl alcohol, which is rubbing alcohol, like we could buy at any national drugstore. Um, and then there's also ethyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is the fastest drying, and it's certainly the most widely used in healthcare. We see that in our alcohol prep pads and other products as well. But ethyl alcohol is actually, believe it or not, a better solution and formulation for alcohol-based hand rubs. And the reason being is sort of twofold. One is that it actually does not dry the skin as much, but from an efficacy standpoint, it actually has better efficacy against viruses than isopropyl. Um, and so this is an advantage that you'll see. And the good news is that most of our US products that are FDA uh, approved here in the United States are certainly all between 60 and 90%, but most of them have actually moved to the ethyl alcohol formulation. So you should be fully compliant with that. Now, one of the other things that we have to think about besides the hands is sort of that second area, which is the contaminated environment of care. Recognizing that we have chairs and overbed tables and we have remotes and we have, you know, the dialysis machine. Uh, we have a lot of shared medical equipment. We have blood pressure cuffs. We have patient monitoring, thermometers, scales, you name it right? We have to make sure that whatever germicide or disinfectant that we're using is going to be appropriate for our patient population. And so number one is all disinfectants in the United States are required by federal law to be EPA registered, right? The EPA does uh, sort of regulate all of these different products out there. You'll see this term hospital grade, um, and I sort of draw uh, caution to that because the term hospital grade can be a little bit misleading. Right. When the average clinician hears it's hospital grade, they assume, well, if it's good enough for the hospital, it's good enough to be used anywhere. Um, and in reality, in the EPA's uh, sort of world of doing things, hospital grade is only uh, effective against three different pathogens. And so it was actually created as a term, sort of a category, many, many years ago to determine whether or not a disinfectant was appropriate for use in healthcare. Now, certainly we can all relate to the fact that in today's times, our complex patients and the complex healthcare environments that we work in, 
three claims is certainly not enough. Uh, broad spectrum is a term that we'll define here in just a moment. Uh, for the dialysis population, you'll see that CDC particularly calls out the use of intermediate level disinfectants anytime there's blood or other body fluids present because of its uh, efficacy against microbacterium. Now, microbacterium, you may say, well, what is that? Well, probably the best example is microbacterium tuberculosis, which of course is TB. Now, the next question would be, well, why would we be worried about TB on an environmental surface? We're not actually worried about TB being spread it on an environmental surface, but the sort of category from a micro standpoint of microbacterium is very difficult to kill. And so if you have an intermediate level disinfectant, it's going to be effective against microbacterium, which means that it's going to actually take care of any of the organisms that are of less resistance underneath that. And so it really just gives you a higher level of efficacy, higher margin of safety when dealing with these complex patients that you might have. And then, of course, it has to be equipment friendly. Uh, it can't destroy our equipment, especially these very, very expensive uh, dialyzing pieces of equipment. Um, that's something that we've got to be aware of from that perspective uh, as well. Um, and our safety profile means that it has to be something that we can you know, use without issue with other patients and staff members around. Now, since we've defined what sort of the germicide classifications are, there's different levels of cleaning and disinfection that we have access to. The term cleaning is a little bit of a misnomer. It simply means that we're trying to remove the bio burden or soil that's present on a surface. So let's say that there was a little bit of blood on an overbed table. You've now discharged that patient. You're getting ready for the next patient. Um, so you've got that next dialysis patient you know, in the waiting room ready to go. Well, before you just disinfect that surface that's grossly contaminated, you need to first clean it, right? And so that cleaning can be done with a cleaning agent. It can be done with paper towels. Uh, it can be done with a disinfectant as well, but it becomes a two-step process. And then we've just defined just a moment ago what the sort of difference between low and intermediate level disinfection is, meaning that intermediate level disinfectants are going to be effective against microbacterium. And, and really in the dialysis setting, there's no indication for high-level disinfection or sterilization uh, that's going to exist unless it's a full outpatient clinic where maybe you're also doing procedures or something like that, and there, there may be a need for sterilization at that point. One of the other things to consider too for the dialysis setting, especially in the outpatient world, is you may see more and more automated devices that are used at the end of the day for sort of terminal cleaning and disinfection, like either fogging machines or UV devices. Um, and so it's important to really consult with an infection prevention expert, as well as deal with whoever may be managing your environment of care, whether that's an in, you know sort of a in-house contractor or, or team, or if you have some type of outsourced uh, you know, management firm that's doing that for you. And, and there's really three different areas that I always sort of think about in terms of my mental checklist uh, related to this. And this, frankly, can really work for many different things in infection control. But first and foremost is the efficacy, meaning does this actually work? Is it actually going to kill the relevant microorganisms that I'm concerned with? And the second bucket is safety. Is it going to be safe for me as the healthcare worker? Is it going to be safe for the patient as well as the environment? Because if I can't answer in the affirmative, then I've started, you know, got to question whether or not this is going to be something that's going to be uh, worth the while and pursuing it even further. And then lastly is compatibility. Uh, again, if I use something that's a very aggressive disinfectant for, um, you know, just a, an example, then what happens to my piece of equipment? Is it going to degrade? Is my plastic going to start to pit? Um, because we know that when equipment starts to fall apart, then we have this whole big risk um, associated with well, does that mean the machine can still be cleaned and disinfected? And likely it cannot be because once the integrity of that skin uh, of the machine itself, right, is broken down, whether it's plastic or stainless steel or some other type of housing, right, that is the protective skin, if you will, of that piece of equipment. And so now we've got an issue where we can't actually disinfect. And you can also have organisms start to set up shop there and actually, um, you know, take residence, if you will. So I mentioned earlier this term broad spectrum, and I, I sort of wanted to define what that looks like. So broad spectrum bacteria is gonna be both gram positive and gram negative. From a virus standpoint, it's gonna be non-enveloped and enveloped. Of course, we wanna make sure we're taking care of our MDROs, our multi drug resistant organisms. Um, our bloodborne pathogens are actually required by law. Uh, so that's gonna be covered under the OSHA regulation, and the minimum there is both HIV and hepatitis B virus. Uh, and we're seeing certainly an uptick in pathogenic fungal organisms, um, and so we need to be cognizant of those as well. 
Now, the one on the far right is, is one that people always ask me about. And they said, well, how do we know if this particular disinfectant or this hand hygiene agent or whatever it may be is effective against something like Ebola or SARS-CoV-2, which caused COVID-19 or the next big pathogen that we have? And reality, you know, most uh, laboratories that do the testing for those types of products, for obvious reasons, are not going to want to test these things. Um, it would just be very unsafe for them. And frankly, we don't want these organisms just running around with uh, random labs. And so what CDC does is they essentially characterize the organism from a micro microbiology standpoint. They share that information with the EPA, which regulates disinfectants. And they essentially say, well, wait a minute, this is an organism that's similar. Uh, based on that, we are going to take all the current products on the market that are EPA registered, and if they are effective against this sister organism, right, this representative organism, then they will be deemed ineffective against this emerging pathogen. And so we've done this for many, many years with Ebola, with uh, bird flu. We've done this most recently with um, COVID, uh, also with monkeypox. And so this is just another example of where there is a little bit of guidance out there from the government about how to properly select uh, these types of products. So here's an interesting one. There are different types of claims that we have to sort of sift through that exist out there. Now, in the dialysis setting, one of our challenges is that there's not a ton of literature out there specific to these topics that actually took place in the dialysis setting. And while that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's also not a good thing, because the more things that we can get that are a little bit more specific to our clinical practice setting, obviously, the more we can apply those directly. But it's not to discount that there are many, many different projects out there and published papers and CDC reports, as well as guidance documents that tell us what we should be doing, right? There's not a lot of difference um, out there. And as my little brother likes to remind me all the time, who's an attorney, it doesn't matter where the care is delivered. It's just that it's care, right? Healthcare is delivered the same every single place you go, or at least it should be from a safety standpoint, an efficacy standpoint, and certainly a cost standpoint. And so there are different types of claims that we can pursue. The sort of most common is what we call our bench top or simulation efficacy testing, where you know you have a manufacturer that takes a specific product and they do it in a lab and they say, well, based on this simulated test, right? There's no real world component to it because it's not done in a healthcare setting. It's all done under controlled environments. Here's how we think this would perform, right? And so that's sort of the first one. Then we have the sort of clinical setting efficacy and performance test which again, we're now gonna take it into a clinical setting, maybe through a product trial, or we'll do something a little bit more extended, but it's done in a healthcare setting, preferably in a setting that you actually work in. Now we're starting to sort of raise the value of this level of evidence. And then lastly is outcome studies, right? And these are typically things that are completely independent, not done in collaboration with the manufacturer. And a lot of times you'll actually see some of this stuff actually funded by CDC as well. The goal again is to get to a positive outcome that says if you do X, Y, and Z, you can expect, well, I'm just making this up, a 25% reduction in healthcare associated infections, right? And so it's more of an outcome based study, or if you do X, Y, and Z, the mortality of these patients will change by, you know, this particular percent, just making that up. So let's transition and now talk a little bit about um, specifically wall boxes in dialysis settings. Because remember that not only do we have the patient that's vulnerable, we have a, a pretty, you know, uh, uh, under-resourced environment in dialysis in general with staffing, which we do across healthcare right now. And then we've got sort of these environmental risk factors that we'll talk a little bit more in detail about in our third webinar. But I, I wanted to talk today about wall boxes, right? And so you've got sort of a picture here, um, but these are the frames that are actually recessed into the wall, and they're going to be actually connected to each single station. Right. And so the challenge with this is that you've got lots of them from a quantity. You've got the, the ability to receive those acid and base components, but you've also got the ability to receive the water. So let's just say that your water filter is not functioning correctly. Well, you can see very quickly what could potentially happen here or your waste filter is not functioning well and you're not able to get waste out of the machine. Right. These are all potential risks that exist with these particular boxes. And so we do need to make sure that we're disinfecting these on a regular basis. Now, how do we need to, to sort of monitor that? Well, first and foremost, we have to have a policy in, in place that says here's what the, the frequency is, and it needs to be based on the manufacturer's instructions for use or IFUs, because the manufacturer not only knows what was tested, but they also know what will work and what will not work. 
And so these surfaces should be disinfected at least once a day. And so this could be more of a terminal thing that you do at the end of the day, just as an example. Now the general cleaning and disinfection though, you're gonna be doing on a more frequent basis. And, and a lot of that's gonna be done between every single patient. Now, when you're doing this though, this is not something of course that we should be doing when the patient is still sitting there, but yet we continue to hear that that happens quite frequently where people are trying to sort of turn the station over and the patient's still sitting in the chair. Maybe they're not connected anymore. Or maybe they had a little hematoma or something. Um, but our goal again is to make sure that the patient is moved out so we can have full control over that space. Um, and then actually uh, go ahead and disinfect that. And going back to what we mentioned earlier, right? We're gonna use the exact same types of disinfectants. It's gotta be an EPA registered disinfectant. And the key here is it's gotta be compatible with the particular piece of equ equipment that you're using. So if your manufacturer um, has done their homework, they should be able to tell you two, three, sometimes four or five different chemicals that they've been validated with, right? This is very, very helpful. Now, this may require you to have a specific disinfectant um, sp um, for your piece of equipment that may be different than everything else, particularly if you might be in a hospital setting. But our goal is to make sure we protect the equipment, we keep the integrity of the, the plastic or whatever it may be made out of, and we're not going to do anything to jeopardize the, the manufacturer's warranty. Those high touch surfaces where our connection points um, need to be disinfected for sure. Um, you know, and this is, you know, something that we have to make sure we're following all the instructions for use um, are, that are there. What about biofilms, right? So this is another challenge that we face, um, you know, as well. If you've got a patient that has, um, uh, you know, a, a high risk uh, MGRO, for example, and they're a known colonized person and maybe let's say they have an open draining wound and they've got all these other things going on and we do a poor job of disinfecting that, that patient care area, um, we can have challenges. The same could be true if we don't properly maintain our drains. Uh, and so we've got this water that's coming in and so having good regular maintenance to ensure that things like our drains are functioning correctly, that we've got drain gels in there and cleaners, that we're using an enzymatic as necessary to get rid of any, any gross uh, organic soils, this is all gonna help us prevent that. Because keep in mind that once a biofilm is essentially formed, it's almost impossible to get rid of it other than to replace that affected uh, area of the equipment. We've seen this in other spaces with uh, pieces of more interventional equipment like endoscopes, uh, where you know a biofilm would form and the only possible way to get rid of it is to actually go in there and chop those affected pieces of equipment out uh, and actually replace them completely. Uh, and so clogs can be another issue where if they're not properly dealt with by a specifically qualified plumber, then we know that this can uh, cause a, a challenge for us because we can have backup and regurgitation into the system. Part of this goes back to not only the practices that we're talking about having a policy in place, but to also make sure that the staff know what they're supposed to do. We are struggling right now with just basic staffing in healthcare. And so to layer on top of that, providing additional education and competency is, is a big ask right now, of course, but it's one that has to happen because staff need to understand sort of what their role is. They need to understand specifically how they can be a part of the solution and also what's expected from them from a core practices standpoint, uh, specifically with hand hygiene, you know, uh, core things like the use of PPE, uh, making sure that folks are disinfecting the surfaces um, and also doing regular assessment and monitoring of those areas. The last piece with the, the wall box uh, surveillance specifically is doing routine surveillance, right? To make sure that if we're seeing random things show up in cultures or we're seeing bloodstream infections, particularly bloodstream infections that are coming back positive from a culture perspective for gram negatives, then we've got to start to ask ourselves that question, wait a minute, is there a potential biofilm that's present here? Is there some type of com commonality with an environmental reservoir that we need to be aware of? And again, I can't stress enough the value of them collaborating immediately with public health, because maybe this is not just something that your facility is experiencing, but it could be something that's more widespread on a geographic basis. And so getting public health looped in as quickly as possible is gonna be an important element from that standpoint. What about staff education and competency? Now, this is a challenging one, right? Because we know that folks can have lots of education, they can be exposed to lots of material, but maybe there's never a movement in their level of their competency, 
Uh, and so this can be really, really difficult for us because you spend so much time and money on doing required learnings, computer-based trainings, annual training, and in many cases, you actually don't see the movement, right? And so we need to see the change in the competency of the individuals because I don't want somebody taking care of me that's educated. I want somebody taking care of me that's highly competent. And so basic practices like how to properly access the line, how to properly access the fistula, what's sort of the meaning of aseptic technique, which continues to be a big struggle for us as a healthcare community. Um, you know, those are all gonna be important elements. And then our, our sort of competency evaluation needs to be performed at time of hire, right? At least every six to 12 months thereafter. I'm a big fan of go more. Um, you know, if you wanna do something once a quarter, I think that's even better. You're never gonna be faulted for going above and beyond, but you will always be faulted for going uh, well below sort of the minimum expectations. And make sure that new hire orientation for your new staff members is, is really robust so that people can be successful in their roles. And so CDC does take this a little bit more granular in terms of what types of competency should we be looking for. And this just gives you four of the sort of top ones that we should be uh, very, very focused in on, in my opinion, which is gloving and hand hygiene, catheter change techniques, right, for our catheter dressing changes, vascular access technique, uh, as well as safe injection and, and safe medication practices. All of these fall back within those core practices for infection prevention and control, as I referenced before. Now, it doesn't matter if we have great dressing change techniques or we've got good vascular access techniques. If our hand hygiene and our use of PPE is poor, it's gonna dramatically impact that and it's gonna make it uh, a problem for us. And again, with all the different medications and accessing uh, that's taking place either of a patient's fistula um, or their actual catheter, right? We know that there's gonna be um, a big, big need for safe injection and medication practices. Um, you know, despite us being in a very, very advanced from a medical standpoint country, we still see um, big, big gaps in issues um, uh, related to safe injection practices, even to this day, which is just uh, baffling to me. And so again, I'll show you a resource at the end of today's program that if you need some tools uh, and educational uh, resources and you don't want to have to start from, from the ground up, we'll make those available to you um, as well. So what about patient engagement and education? You know, the patient, especially in the outpatient setting, is definitely the controller of their destiny. They're in charge of their care. And so we need to give them the respect and the authority that's uh, owed to them from that perspective, but also give them all the information necessary to keep them safe, right? And so our goal here is to really be um, great patient advocates, make sure we engage the families if they're uh, part of that discussion, but also talk about the risk and what we can do to mitigate those risks. That's going to help us, right? And so when we think about, excuse me, sort of the, um, the, the challenges with the dialysis patient, right? They have comorbidities. They have uh, unique environmental challenges with the pieces of equipment. Uh, many of them are coming in multiple times a week, um, or maybe they're in the hospital setting and they're getting acute care dialysis. They have potentially um, challenges in their, in their homes with diet. And so they, they're going to be difficult patients to manage on a routine basis, right? That combined with the fact that we can do everything in our power to prevent healthcare associated infections is gonna be an important element here, right? And so our goal is to get as, as actively engaged with our patients as humanly possible, right? Within, within reason um, and, and also help them help us so that we can sort of share that accountability. Right, there are things that we should focus in on, like hand hygiene and making sure that if they see us do something that we shouldn't, that they stop us and 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 allow us an opportunity to correct that behavior before it becomes harmful. Right, we we also have to consider that there's more and more patients receiving dialysis in the peritoneal form at, at the house. Right, so they're actually in their own homes. So we need to talk to them about you know going swimming or bathing or what what are the restrictions that they can do. How do we need to monitor them for signs of infection and sepsis? Uh, especially for systematic sepsis where we can see these patients not survive uh, associated with that. What do we need to do in, in sort of terms of adverse events? Um, and so again, going back to those basic infection control practices during the assessment process. Now, one of our fundamental tools in our tool belt is to get rid of catheters when we can, right? Get to a more permanent solution that will allow us the opportunity to say, let's get to a, an indwelling device um, that is going to be more permanent something that's not gonna be truly artificial. So let's do a fistula as an example. Let's get rid of um, a central catheter. Now they may have 
a specific need for those temporarily, especially in, in sort of their initial points of di diagnosis um, or maybe some acute care management, but we need to get them back and off of those uh, catheters if at all possible, because again, the body's gonna start to attack that because it's foreign. We wanna make sure that we are specifically uh, focused in on uh, medical necessity of catheters and getting to what is gonna be the most appropriate management tool for vascular access for these patients. And so there's different ways that we can do this. You know, first and foremost is to learn what we're doing now, the, both the good and the bad, right? To figure out, are we really being compliant with our own policy? Are we compliant, uh, should, or should I say, is our policy compliant with national best practices with both CDC and KDOKI? Um, and then also look at our staff adherence to those established practices. You know, are they doing a good job? Are they consistent in their practice? Are they disinfecting the device before they enter it? Are they washing their hands or sanitizing their hands before? And then this allows us from a quality improvement standpoint to say, okay, here's what we found, sort of our observations, and here's what we expect to happen, All right? Again, going back to that continuous quality improvement so that we can always be successful with what our initiatives are. And, and this is a great graphic that CDC has out there that sort of talks about the different general levels of risk associated with all three different types, AV fistula, AV graft, uh, and central line catheters. And as we've mentioned multiple times during today's program, the central line catheter is not the ideal solution here. It's, it's great for temporary means, but our goal should be to transition them over to a fistula as quickly as possible when they're uh, a candidate for that. Get, get rid of that catheter, make sure that we, we you know, monitor them for signs of infection, um, but this is really our best possible chance. And it does require us to have a more of a vascular access management plan which again, we don't do a ton of, um, you know, and so this is something that's important for folks that are receiving dialysis in the outpatient setting, as well as long-term care residents um, and acute care uh, patients as well. And so we wanna be sensitive to that. Chlorhexidine is a chemical that's been around for many, many years, well over 50 years in its aqueous form, our water-based form, but most recently it was actually added into skin antiseptics in, in sort of an alcoholic form. And so you'll see in the United States, at least, that there's two FDA-approved concentrations of chlorhexidine. There's a 2% and a 3.15% uh, that are FDA-approved. Those are the only two that are out there. Those are designed for use on human skin. There's also another 3.15% uh, CHG solution that is approved for medical devices, um, specifically for you actually to scrub uh, devices before you access those. Those are the only three that currently have approval. The CDC's guidelines, you'll notice, say greater than a 0.5% solution, right, for that sort of first-line skin antiseptic. And the reason they went with 0.5 is that there is a 0.5% that is used um, primarily in the neonatal population. So it's not relevant, or relative, uh, excuse me, to today's conversation, but that's why you'll see that in a lot of the different CDC guidance out there. Um, it's also not a solution that you typically see available commercially in the United States but it is available internationally uh, from that perspective as well. Now, we all know that with any particular medication, there's always that possibility for an adverse drug uh, event or some type of allergic reaction. And so there is sort of a, um, a method where you can you know, document that. And then if that patient is not able to tolerate chlorhexidine and gluconate, then you can go to a PVP iodine solution, uh, preferably one, as they mentioned, with alcohol, but those are very, very hard to find. Um, or you can use a 70% isopropyl alcohol, which again is rubbing alcohol for those patients that do have um, either documented or suspected uh, sensitivity or anaphylaxis to that. So what about the catheter hub itself, right? We wanna make sure that before we actually access that we're gonna scrub uh, that cap um, you know, when it's removed and before accessing, we're gonna do this every single time. So it doesn't matter if you, you know, give 10 different medications or, 10, or push 10 different things of fluid, uh, it does require us to disinfect um, between each one of those. And there are some different definitions that exist out there that have been quite confusing for folks. I think we're all uh, very familiar with catheter and blood, so I'm not gonna go through that. But the hub itself, right, is the end of that central venous catheter that connects to the blood lines or the cap. Right, and then the cap itself is actually the device that screws on and occludes the hub. So two different things that are there. Um, and so a lot of times we talk about scrub the hub, um, and in reality we're not. That's not actually what we're we're meaning to say. So just wanted to sort of point that out there. And then our last area that we're going to explore is antimicrobial ointment, 
right? And, and this is a unique thing because we don't see this in other pa patient populations, but in the dialysis world, we do wanna think about the use of an antibiotic um, ointment or some type of PVP um, ointment as well for our catheter exit sites. Uh, and that's gonna be during the dressing change. You know, the goal here is again, to reduce the risk um, associated with this. I will tell you that um, certain PVP iodines can be more uh, dermally uh, sensitive and irritating uh, to human skin. So just make sure that if you've got a patient with a potential PVP iodine allergy, that you do a small test area or uh, you know confirm for sure if they do have that allergy. The same would be true with chlorhexidine too. So just like with anything, there's always gonna be that potential possibility from that perspective. And there is also another FDA uh, approved chlorhexidine impregnated sponge dressing uh, that's out there that could be used as an acceptable alternative um, also. So what about the type of actual ointment? As I mentioned before, a PVP iodine, um, or you could do a triple antibiotic ointment uh, as well. Now the challenge is the triple ointment is not typically available in the United States. Um, and so there are other ointments out there um, you know, that you can get, uh, you know, uh, one of those is listed there with the triple antibiotic ointment on bullet point number three. Uh, that one is typically widely available. There's also muparicin is also um, something that's pretty easy to get your hold, uh, hold on to. But again, our, our, our sort of concern, generally speaking here, is that what's the overall risk to antimicrobial resistance that's associated with, you know, repeated use all the time with this. Luckily, we've not seen a ton um, of that out there, but it's also not something that we've seen a, a fair amount of study on. I'll just say that from that perspective. One of the other challenges too, as we get towards the end of today's program, is that if we use an ointment, just like we talked about with disinfectants on surfaces, if we use an ointment, it has to be compatible with the catheter. Um, because if not, we could have degradation of the catheter, we can have the catheter start to you know, fall apart. Uh, there's all kinds of bad, bad things that can take place there. And so our, our goal here is to ensure that we have full compatibility based on the manufacturer's instructions for use uh, with these particular ointments. Um, and that way we're not gonna damage either the patient's skin or also um, our, our actual uh, um, catheter itself. And as I referenced earlier, I did wanna make sure that I provided you a couple of additional tools and resources. The Clean Hands can, uh, Count uh, campaign is all about hand hygiene. It's got some really, really great video, social media tools, as well as a, a patient and, and healthcare worker education toolkit that's available to you on the CDC's website. And then there's also the, the One Needle, One Syringe, Only One Time campaign, uh, the one and only, if you will. And again, this is a reminder that even in the United States of America, we continue to have misuse of needles and syringes or medication vials. And so this continues to be a problem uh, that we have to explore on a routine basis. And lastly is, is a web link here that I would strongly, strongly encourage you to become engaged with if you're not already, which is the Making Dialysis Safer Coalition through CDC. Uh, this is a extremely broad coalition that is looking at best practices across the United States, um, specifically for dialysis. Uh, it's, it's not just infection control related, but it does have a, a pretty large focus in that area but you'll see not only resources and checklists and all kinds of other tools, but you'll also get an opportunity to hear directly from the horse's mouth some of the things that are coming down the pipeline as they relate to hemodialysis settings uh, from that perspective. So as we get towards the Q&A portion of uh, today's program, you know, one of the things that's so imperative is to always have our eye on the prize. And that really requires us to have that comprehensive approach to infection prevention and control this will help us you know, maintain the safety of these vulnerable patient populations with uh, dialysis patients, but also allows us to really make sure we're able to deliver upon our promise to our patients. You know, One of the, the big things is that, especially in the dialysis space, these are really well-trained people that do a specific type of care and to replace them is not something that we can do easily. Um, and so as we create these force multipliers, right, those are gonna be done by having a high level of competency in your frontline healthcare professionals. And that does require a lot of work and it requires a lot of time and money um, to do that. And then lastly is what we did yesterday is gonna be different than what we did today. And hopefully will be different than what we do tomorrow. And, and our goal is to get every single day stronger than what we were the last 24 hours and the 24 hours before that uh, as well. And so that requires us to be walking around to doing some mitigation work to you know prepare nostrils for any types of um, challenges that may come down the pike like COVID-19 or other future um, outbreaks and to think ahead about pandemic preparedness so that we can be even more effective. So with that, I'll stop and see if we have any, any questions from the audience. 
um, as well. And it looks like we do have a few. So I'm just going to go ahead and unmute um, uh, Susan as well so that she can chime in as needed. Uh, it looks like our, our first question that we have uh, is, do you think that there will be changes in dialysis, infection prevention and control as a result of COVID-19? Um, I'll sort of address it from the infection control standpoint and I'll let sort of Susan address it from the surveillance standpoint. I, I hope that we have all learned something valuable from COVID. Um, you know, we, we have made some pretty big mistakes and we've also done some things really well. Uh, and so I think we can learn equally from those. Um, but we cannot afford to go back to a land of complacency and sort of burying our heads in the sand um, and thinking that we'll just do things the exact same way that we always have before, because that, as we all know, is not going to prove to be a very successful uh, project for us. Um, and so I I'm hopeful that things will change. Uh, Susan, do you want to add anything uh, from that, just from an NHS standpoint? Susan, I'm not sure if you heard the question. I must have been on mute. I apologize. No problem. No problem. So I think from um, an outbreak situation such as COVID-19 that we have learned a lot at how to protect our patients. And I do think things will change as far as being able to protect our patients in their healthcare environment, like much like we have with COVID-19. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, looks like the next question is a, a great question. And what about when the patient receives dialysis in the patient room and it's actually done from the sink and not from a, a dialysis unit? So that's a, a very good question because we certainly see that happening, especially in the intensive care setting. Um, this would be a perfect example of getting your infection preventionist uh, in the loop ahead of time, as well as building services um, and biomedical engineering. Uh, there are things that can be put in place like different types of drains and filters that can be set up in those high-risk environments to help mitigate that risk, particularly as it relates to water. Um, the other challenge too is the sinks in the rooms, you know, to your, to your question have, they're not very good with splashing, right? And so we've got all kinds of other challenges associated with this. One of the other things related to biofilms that we have to be aware of is that those drains in the sinks can be big culprits uh, for biofilm formation. And so you may wanna look at some other type of drain mechanism or drain maintenance uh, as I like to call it uh, as well. I, I will tell you there is a CDC water management toolkit uh, that is available on the cdc.gov uh, website. If you just go to cdc.gov forward slash HAI, at the very top right of that, you'll see a little search bar. And if you type in water management, that toolkit will pop up and that will also give you some specific parameters you may wanna consider. Uh, I do know that this is also something that's addressed in the KDOKI guidelines briefly as well, but the water management toolkit would be the place that I would start. Um, and, and if you sort of designate, these are the rooms where we can do this, that way you can plan ahead and then sort of deal with that. And, and lastly, as environmental services needs to be aware of when dialysis was um, sort of performed in that room. So if there's extra precautions that need to be taken, uh, maybe there were blood spills or something like that, or chemical spills, they certainly need to be in the loop uh, related to that uh, also. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Uh, looks like the next question that we have is, are there things that we are not doing well that we should start doing? Um, that's a tough one. Uh, I think there's a lot of things in healthcare that we could do better, um, but I also think there's some things that we do well. Um, you know, to me, if I had to pick one uh, from our list that we've talked about today, I would say to have more engaged leaders. Um, and I, I think I see Dr. Carrico shaking her head on that one too. You know, when we have engaged leadership at the very top echelons of any healthcare organization, whether it's an outpatient dialysis clinic, whether it's an inpatient, um, you know, facility, it doesn't matter where it is. So much is possible because the leader is engaged and the leader is empowering and supporting the frontline staff. Um, that combined with really engaged frontline staff, you can really write your ticket to do anything with in terms of infection prevention. Um, because the thing that we're always missing is resources, right, and engaged folks, um, and, and frankly, the knowledge of what to do. The good news here is that we, we have the knowledge. We know what is right. We also have the tools. We know what tools we should be using. The challenge for us is, is always goes back to time and money. Um, and, and really, our patients deserve for us to take the time necessary to deliver upon our promise to our patients, which is safe, reliable, and efficacious care. 
And we, we can certainly actually save money from a quality perspective by reducing the incidence of preventable infections. And so while people may say, well, it costs too much to do that. No, it actually doesn't. It actually saves you money in the long run by reducing the bounce back admissions, by reducing the, uh, the readmission, should I say, reducing the incidences of infection and all the other uh, hospitalizations and things of, of that nature. Um, and so that's, that's an important element uh, to consider from that perspective. Uh, it looks like we have one additional question uh, related to disinfection. Uh, you made reference to the EPA regulating um, disinfectants. Is there a way for me to know if my disinfectant is appropriate for use in dis, uh, dialysis settings? Um, so depending upon what you are looking to uh, inactivate or we like to call kill, right? Which organisms you're trying to kill, the EPA does have different lists available out there. So your big sort of organisms that you must kill are gonna be HIV and hepatitis B because that's required by OSHA regulation. Um, and then CDC's disinfection and sterilization guidelines will sort of guide you down the healthcare pathway. Um, and you're gonna be looking for your basic MGROs, your contact you know, pathogens like MRSA. Uh, certainly wanna take care of things like influenza and RSV and, and, and rhinovirus, that kind of stuff. Um, but you know the EPA's lists are specific to one particular pathogen. So for example, let's say you had a patient that was there to be dialyzed, they had diarrhea, um, you found out that they had C. diff. Well, there's a list for C. diff. Um, there's a list for Ebola. There's a list for specific pathogens out there uh, that you can use. But your, your regular EPA uh, registered hospital grade disinfectants uh, are typically gonna be just fine for this. Uh, you'll also find in the dialysis setting, of course, that there's a lot of use of bleach that sodium hypochlorite solution, and you'll find that there's both one to 10 and one to 100, depending upon what you're disinfecting, whether it's the piece of equipment or just an environmental surface. So again, going back to the manufacturer's instructions for use, uh, make sure you're following those carefully so that you, A, are getting the efficacy that you're trying to achieve, but most importantly, you're also not degrading the equipment where you could have even more massive issues with uh, degradation associated with that uh, also. So excellent, excellent question. Uh, so, Dr. Kerko, I don't see any other questions in our queue on our end, so I'll go ahead and turn the program back over to you to see uh, what closing comments you have for us. Sure, and you know, I was I was so struck with what what you spoke about, and I think you have included some uh, additional information in the attached ebook that I think will be helpful. Some of the checklists that that you mentioned, but I think you know that just kind of summarizing, you talked about the importance of core or basic practices. And you also talked about the importance of ensuring that those are in place regardless of where dialysis is occurring. So that notion of implementing those basic practices, ensuring that we have a single standard of care, that every patient has equal opportunity for best practice care regardless of when or where the procedure is, uh, is done. And the questions I think have really underscored the importance of of having that type of basic information pulled together using some of the guidance like you, you had in the ebook, maybe some examples of the germicides that you gave, having, um, uh, getting those labels so that the, the individuals in the setting can actually read the label and know what the manufacturer's instructions for use are. So it's taking us back to that, that basic information, uh, what is included also in a number of the Project First Line activities, how we can train all personnel on basic practices, and then restarting after we we are hopefully at a different place in the pandemic and think about what our new normal is going to be. So I think the comments that we've gotten from you, the comments from Susan have been a great start uh, for this series, and I look forward to the next one. I think uh, we'll be uh, the same the same time next week, right, one one week from today. Um, and information, I believe, has already gone out if people are, are interested in getting on the list for, um, uh, for the uh, upcoming sessions. I think they can email you. You've got your contact information there. We can send that out to them uh, and, uh, and then add any additional uh, information that they uh, may have requested from, from these, uh, uh, these few questions that we got from the audience that were quite excellent. So thank you and thanks uh, to Susan. And I look forward to seeing the group again next Wednesday.